The first question is, uh, after Peter matured, he wrote that if we diligently followed his teachings in 2 Peter 1.10, we will never stumble. Is it fair then to say that though we all ebb and flow in our obedience to Christ, it is possible to mature to the point of no longer sinning in our earthly life? Obviously not. They just need to spend time with Dr. Thomas, and they know the answer to that. Boy, isn't that the truth? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, any reading of Romans 7 would make it very clear. Paul, as a mature believer, um, I can't remember even how many years from Acts 9 until Romans 7, but um, at least 20 years, um, Paul is growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's fair to say he's the greatest Christian who ever lived. And yet, in Romans 7, he's still saying, that which I do, I don't want to do. That which I don't do, I wish I did. A wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of sin. So that's Paul as a mature believer. And there's a sense in which, as you grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, you become far more painfully aware of your sin. And you never become sinless, but you do sin less. There will be a growth. And you can track in Paul's writings, uh, he first says, said, I am the least of the apostles. And then, I think it's three years later, he said, I think that was Ephesians 3, he then says, I am the least of all the saints. But then five years later, he writes, I'm the chief of sinners. So the closer you draw to the light, the more aware you are of your imperfections. It's the one who's furthest away from the light sees less of their own imperfections. So the closer you draw to the light, you're, you're not becoming sinlessly perfect. You are realizing how much further you have to go in the pursuit of personal holiness. In Philippians 3, you know, we are to be always pressing on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, but none of us have arrived. And Warfield wrote a whole volume on perfectionism. Uh, to just totally debunk that false theological position. So, uh, the statement, of course, is still true that Peter makes that, that if we follow his teachings, um, the point is that we don't. Um, so, so, so if if we truly did obey, uh, we would be perfect. How do I effectively combine Reformed theology and addiction ministry to reach the broken? The broken meaning emotionally broken? I think they're specifically talking about drug addiction. Drug addiction? Well, I would say the only hope for them is a sovereign God that is presented in Reformed theology who is greater than any addiction and is greater than any pattern of sin. And I think that it is Reformed understanding of sanctification and the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit who gives the, us the greatest hope that there is. Um, and if I had a, a lesser theological position, I think I would be far more discouraged about ever crawling out of this hole. But with Reformed theology, Philippians 2.13, for it is God who is at work within you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. I mean, that's, that to me is, is a vibrant note of, of, of hope for God to pull me out of this addiction. I just want to applaud those who give themselves to counseling folk who suffer from addiction. It's, it's actually interesting, I think, both in medieval and Reformation theology, that 
sin and sanctification are viewed in terms of creating habits, of refining one's life into a certain pattern and doing that over and over. And killing sin is, in one sense, attacking the addiction, the habit forming nature of sin. And at that point, I think that medieval and Reformation theology are on the same page. But, you know, whatever the addiction is, and it, and it could be sexual addiction and porn addiction and drug addiction and alcohol addiction, um, it, it, it's, it's where some of us might, might differ as to the sufficiency of Scripture in the sense that um, common grace, science, medicine, psychiatry um, can, can often be insightful and helpful in um, a, a full multi-task approach to dealing with addiction. But it, it is rarely successful uh, unless, first of all, there is the power of Scripture to address every aspect of our being, and, and not least the will. Um, and um, so, so it's the Bible, but it's the Bible plus the insights of common grace to um, address the issue of addiction. It must be accompanied by the sufficiency of the Holy Spirit. And so where it's where the Word of God and the Spirit of God work in tandem together. That is where um, true life change takes place. And of course, in the Acts 2 passage, which we just looked at, um, it was the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as it came with great power as the Word was being brought forth. So it's not just the Word independent of the Spirit, it's the Spirit, or it's the Word and the Spirit. When those two are married, then great things happen. Where in the Bible are we commanded to believe all that God has set forth and affirm in His Word? Uh, whether stated… My glasses. <laughs> whether stated… That still doesn't help. Oh, explicitly, whether stated explicitly or derived by good and necessary consequence. Where in the Bible are we commanded to believe all that God has set forth and affirmed in His Word? Specific verse citations, if possible. I don't know that I entirely understand the question, which I'm sure Derek does. <laughs> in fact, that one is so simple. Uh, I'm going to yield to my, <laughs> my younger colleague. Come, come up with a verse, Steve, that, in the Bible that, that commands full obedience to what is written. Oh, my goodness. Well, obviously, I mean, we just start with the Ten Commandments. Um, I mean, those are not ten suggestions. I mean, those are not ten options. Those are not ten preferences. In fact, it's referred to as the law, and the law of God, that implies clearly uh, our obedience to it. Now, if we, if we wanted to do a study on obedience… Go to the Great Commission. Okay. <laughs> I'll take coaching. I'll take coaching. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, all right, Matthew… Teaching them to observe. Oh, okay. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> I'd like to get a running start. <laughs> At verse 19, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, which is obedience, all that I have commanded, or all that I have taught or commanded. I can't remember which, which is the verb. Someone help me. Which is it? Taught. taught. All that I've taught, I've edited myself. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And how important is the Great Commission? Um, as a text. As a text. 
Well, it is, it is uh, it's been well said, last words should be lasting words. And these are our Lord's last words given to the church. And if we fumble the ball here, then, then it's kind of like if you don't touch first base, it doesn't matter if you go to second or third, you're out. That's a baseball analogy, Day, Derek. <laughs> His wife is the baseball fan in their family. Um, he's out shining his pickup truck out in the, <laughs> out in the driveway. So, I, I mean, obvious. I mean, uh, you know, Romans 1, 2 talks about the Holy Scripture, and in verse 5, it talks about the obedience of faith. I mean, those two are inseparably bound together in the same context, that there is no true faith without obedience. Obedience to what? Obedience to the Holy Scripture in verse, um, in verse 2. You can go to Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, and Paul says, but you became obedient to that form of teaching. You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching, referring to uh, the written Word of God from the Old Testament as well as the apostles' teaching that would become written in the New Testament. So, so well, please, the, please the, add to that. Well, the, the good and necessary consequence would be something like infant baptism and that great text in Acts chapter 2. <laughs> but I won't… R.C. is still with us. <laughs> To, to you and to your children. Yes. But, but the doctrine of the Trinity, because I, <laughs> because I love you. <laughs> That's becoming debatable, but go ahead. <laughs> I mean, clearly the New Testament teaches that there is only one God, but the New Testament also teaches with absolute clarity that there is more than one who is that one God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And, and those are just facts, but how do you put those facts together, that there is a God who is three and a God who is one? What is… How do, we, how do we put in theological language three in oneness? And, and at that point, you're drawing a good and necessary consequence. I'm done. Oh, we're done? We're done. <laughs> I was wanting to reread well, the question. Well, we could go back to… Because <laughs> I, 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 think, I think we left the question a while ago. I think we left the ago. question. All of a sudden, we got to infant baptism, <laughs> and it's like, All right. I just would like to see that question one more time. We'll, we'll move on. Okay. Can we deny inerrancy and be saved and grow in the Christian life? So, there's actually maybe two elements to that. Can we deny inerrancy and be saved? and grow in the Christian life. All right, you've been asked that in class many times. I can tell you how Dr. Sproul answered this question, but I want to hear you answer first. Oh, that's not fair. Um, not, not at all. Yes, of course. You can deny all kinds of truths and, and be a rebellious Christian. You can grow, but by… by by limping along. You're never going to become mature. Um, th there are all kinds of truths that can be denied. Um, do, you, do you have to affirm Calvinism? Do you have to affirm the five points? Do you have to affirm infant baptism? Do you have to <laughs> affirm I knew Presbyterian church government? Um, and, and I'm sure we will be surprised when we get to heaven as to who is there and maybe who is not there. I mean that seriously. No, I think the answer is yes. You can deny inerrancy and be saved. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Sproul worked on the Chicago Statement of Inerrancy in 1970, a principal architect of the Chicago Statement. And in 2015, we worked on the Christology Statement here at Ligonier, the Word Made Flesh. And as he reflected on that, he was talking about the, the importance of the Christology statement, because that's the gospel. And who Christ is and what He has done cannot be denied, and you're still preaching the gospel. And he made the explicit point even more so than 
the inerrancy. I think it's the second part that's interesting and grow in the Christian life. It seems like as you mature in the Christian life, you need that understanding of the authoritative Word of God, and if it's God's yeah, Word… Yeah, I would agree with Derek that you're going to be limping along yeah. and having to hurdle speed bumps, and, and you're going to be held back. Um, if, if you are doubting the Word of God, I mean, I can't even imagine, really, a true believer doubt, yeah. doubting the Word of God because saving faith is the gift of God that He gives and he gives, a, he gives saving faith that is able to lay hold of the promises of God. And Hebrews 11 verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. I, I mean, you, you're, you're going no further than first base to be charitable if you're doubting the inerrancy of the Word of God. Faith is no greater than the object of faith. And if you are putting your faith in an object that you think is flawed, then you're driving your car with the emergency brake on, um, and you're in reverse gear. I mean, you're not going forward very well. And the, and the history of the church is a fearful warning in the 20th century that those who begin to doubt the authority of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, the infallibility of Scripture, the trajectory is almost invariably downwards. Yeah, they're on a slippery slope, and it doesn't j stop there. It will cascade down further and ending up in some other denials. Do Jesus' words hold more weight than, say, what Paul or Matthew or Isaiah says? They're equally inspired. Um, some things in the Bible are more important than other, others, and even some things that Jesus said were more important than other things that He said. That's why He would say, truly, truly, I say unto you. So what follows is going to rise to a higher level of importance, but not to a higher level of inspiration or inerrancy. And what Paul said has the same purity of truth as what Jesus said. So, um, it, it is no more true, it is no more inspired, it is no more inerrant, uh, but granted some things are more important than other things. It, it is actually one of the interesting features of what we mean by the inerrancy of words of Paul or words of Peter, because on one level you could argue that because Jesus was sinless and Paul and Peter were not, that His words therefore would have greater authority. But in fact, the Bible gives the same authority to all of Scripture, including in, 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 Timothy, in Second Timothy, the reference, of course, is to the Old Testament Scriptures. Uh, and therefore to people like Isaiah or, or Ezekiel or David or, or Moses, uh, and, and it doesn't distinguish a kind of red-letter edition. Mm -hmm. yeah. If Scripture is sufficient, why then the tension between classical and presuppositional apologetics? I, I, you know, I suppose this is just true of all the theological differences that we have. We, we could word this, why then the difference between, say, infant and believer's baptism, for instance? <laughs> it's a rose between two thorns. And, and, and part… <clears throat> I mean, there are two possible answers, yeah. at least two possible answers, and one, one is that even good theologians can approach the Scriptures with a grid of their own, and that what's governing their stance on what this means is a presupposed grid that they may not even acknowledge, but it's there, an Arminian grid, a Reformed grid, a Peter Baptist grid, a Baptist or a Credo Baptist grid. So, so that's one explanation. 
An another, another explanation is that there are some parts of Scripture that are hard to understand. Even the Apostle confirms that for us, that there were th some things in Paul that were hard to be understood, even by competent and well-learned theologians like Steve Lawson. Um, so, so… Now you're making sense. <laughs> And, and some of these differences are more important than others, and, and some are not as different as they may appear to be, in that often we, we push two different views to the extreme to, to try and make a point, but actually I've often noticed that when people come and and discuss it, they, they, they come into the middle somewhere and they're on either side of a, of a, of a net, tennis <laughs> imagery. In light of the sufficiency of Holy Scripture and the regulative principle of worship, how do we answer the question of instruments and uninspired hymns in the public worship of God? So, in our tradition, in our Reformed tradition, um, instruments are relatively new in New Testament worship. They're not new, of course, in Old Testament worship. Uh, in that, in that. We understand that in Judaism there, there was the accompaniment of instrumental music in worship. Um, if, and there are two parts to this question, if, if, you, if you adopt an exclusive psalm singing position, as my son-in-law would, and belongs to the um, covenanter tradition, uh, and loyally and faithfully have maintained that position to this day. Um, that means that you can sing about Jesus in pre-fulfillment terms, but you can never say the name Jesus. You can preach the name Jesus, you can pray the name Jesus, but you can't sing the name Jesus. And that that doesn't make sense to me. If, if you only sing the Psalms, you're always in the shadow. You're, you're always in anticipation mode. You're never in fulfillment mode. Um, and, and so for me, my understanding of, say, instrumental worship is, is that this would be a continuity of practice from Old Testament into New Testament, that there's a continuity of um, the manner in which God is to be worshipped, and therefore um, the select and reverent use of instrumentation to enhance congregational singing is um, uh, an argument um, it's like, it's like the good and necessary uh, consequence argument. Yeah, I, I would add to that um, there are instruments in heaven being played, and there's instruments in the Old Testament, and I love the argument of continuity, that it would uh, assume continuity because there's nothing that… It's a Presbyterian. Yeah, yeah I, I, I understand. I understand, sir. <laughs> um, um, so that would, to me, assume the continuity into the New Testament, but it's anchored by their instruments in heaven. I think it would be just a strange, weird argument that you could not have instruments in the New Testament. Um, the, the other thing I would add also is like in Ephesians 5, 19, to sing to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I think 
the perspicuity of that, the, the clarity of that, and Calvin always said that the correct interpretation is the plainest interpretation. We're not looking for hidden meaning. Uh, what, what is most obvious would be the proper interpretation. As, as I just read Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, I go, oh, okay. You can sing psalms, and you could sing hymns, and you could sing spiritual songs. And I know that the covenant or tradition tries to make those different divisions of psalms. I think that's eisegesis. That's not exegesis. That, that's reading into the text that doesn't even say that. You're forcing your, your, your preconceived idea upon a text that, that, that just throws word studies and plain meaning out the window to me. I mean, you, you would never just pick up your Bible and read that verse and come up with that conclusion. You, you would have to go to seminary someplace, <laughs> seriously, and come up with a wacky interpretation like that. So, um, even throwing that text into the mix as, as well, um, you know, in addition, I would add, that like Colossians 1 is known as the Colossian, Colossian hymn. And it, the, the way that it is worded um, it gives the appearance with the symmetry and the balance and the cadence that this was an early hymn sung in the first century church that has, Paul has placed into this text and maybe made a few connecting adaptations so it'll fit in the flow. But there were hymns already being sung that had Christ's name in it, like i.e. Colossians 1, and there are other passages to which we could turn. So, when you add all this up, I just wouldn't want to have to be turning in a term paper to a professor who would grade this and to try to defend, I can only sing the Psalms and I cannot use musical instruments. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am having to argue a case, I think, with both hands tied behind my back. I just want to make, I think, two comments. One is, I'm, I totally agree, not exclusive psalmody, but I think sometimes, in, especially in American evangelical circles, sometimes we go too far the opposite direction and we don't sing the psalms. So, there's a place for those who are not exclusive psalmody to, to think about the psalter as a part of worship. But I was thinking about what you were talking about in terms of if you're, if you're singing the psalms, you're always singing anticipation, you're always in the shadows. And anecdotally, this is Isaac Watts. Uh, you know, the, the Lutheran tradition, we have hymns right from the beginning. And so, one of the things Luther's concerned about is putting a hymnal in the hands of the people of God. And so, Luther's writing hymns right out of the gate. Not so with Calvin and the Reformed Church. And that's the influence over the Puritans and over the church in England. And here's Isaac Watts, young man, walking home as the story has it, as the legend has it, with his father saying, why don't we ever sing about Christ? And his father saying to him, well, if you think you can do better than David in the Psalms, go ahead and try. And something like three weeks later, the congregation is singing the first Isaac Watts hymn. Uh, so that there is that sense of hymnody of bringing out of the shadows of Christ and I think that's the richness of the non-psalmody, non-exclusive psalmody tradition of singing hymns. But there is something to be said for bringing the hymns. And a Mighty Fortress is, of course… Psalm 46. Psalm 46. So, all right, one more question, or maybe two. We'll see how it goes. You're all a gracious audience. Uh, we've talked a little bit about what sufficiency Scripture is not in relation of what we learn from common grace. Could you elaborate or expand on that a little bit more in terms of affirming the sufficiency of Scripture, I think is the question, affirming the su sufficiency of Scripture, but recognizing that we can learn from common grace? Well, an example um, that's m much debated in our circles um, would be A spider. There's a spider. <laughs> that, is, that is a literal bug in the new building, is what that is. Wait a minute, it's on your nose. Don't move. We're going to swat it. <laughs> so, this is the first for Elegant Ear Q&A. Well, the, 
the, the study of arachnophobia would be a, a wonderful example of where scripture is not sufficient. Cue, uh, um, cue the spider. <laughs> um, where was I? Arachnophobia. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the issues that divides us, meaning, meaning the Reformed community at present, is, is the Bible sufficient for counseling? Or can you add to what Scripture teaches um, the findings of modern science and brain science and psychiatry and psychology, and, or are, are, are all of those disciplines moot? And, and I, would, I would come down on the more sort of integrationist side uh, than, than to suggest that there are complex issues in our modern society um, that can be helped and aided by um, the proper scientific study of the human mind and, and, and the integration of the human mind with, with emotion or affection. And, and therefore, um, that, that would be one area where the sufficiency of Scripture needs to be um, needs to be promulgated with, with care. Yeah, I, I think years ago the counseling had gone so far in the direction of, here, just take some pills and just giving a, um, a secular um, reason solution, even medically. And as so often in church history, then the pendulum swings so far in the other direction. And no, 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 it's Scripture only. Well, I think that that pendulum has started to come back and recognizing, I mean, that's almost like a Christian science position. I mean, it's just swung the pendulum way too far. And that there are some medical helps for someone if there are problems being triggered by physiological things, that it would be naive to not allow common grace discoveries to help in bipolar or, you know, um, blood pressure and you're overreacting and wh whatever it would be. So, I, I think I agree exactly with what Derek said. And that's a good place to end. Could you join me in thanking our panelists?